It is Wednesday, September 14th, 2011, and you have found the tip of the spear on the Info War. Info Wars nightly news, weeknights, Monday through Friday, 7 p.m. Central, right here at InfoWarsNews.com and PrisonPlanet.tv. The true cutting edge of alternative media and resistance to tyranny. We've got a lot of news coming up this evening. We're going to be talking to Lord Christopher Moncton and Al Gore's 24 hours of bull****. I don't normally use profanity because I have an eloquent repertoire of semantical language, but there's no way to describe this consummate, bloated, king of used car salesman running around telling us that NAFTA and GATT were going to be great, were deindustrialized, telling us he invented the internet 20 years after it was invented, and it's on record who invented it, uh, telling us that uh, the sea levels were going to rise by last year and swamp all the major cities on the coast didn't happen while he was buying homes on the coast. He is a fraud. He is a joke. He is a scam artist. He is the head of a major oil company. The big oil companies are for the global tax. That's coming up with Lord Christopher Moncton and a breakdown of Al Man Bear Pig, the political prostitutes uh, activities. Stuart Rhodes, the head of Oath Keepers with some incredible police state information and a lot of uh, intel he's getting on attempted neocon coups against Obama to bring in something even worse, if you can believe it. And then, of course, we're going to be looking uh, at the Snoop Society and uh, all the new um, East German-style tattletale systems that are being set up here in the United States. So it's another jam-packed transmission for you this evening. But first, let's go ahead and look at some of the news tonight. The New York Post is reporting, and I went ahead and did some searches this afternoon because I don't trust Rupert Murdoch and the New York Post, and did confirm that the TSA across the country in different locales is asking for tips. When you go to the line, they approach you in some areas and tell you that things will go better if you give them money. If you don't give them money, well, then you get sent to an extra screening area. In fact, the New York Post reports that $5 was not enough, and so groping was then engaged in. Uh, so normally you would go to a brothel to pay to have your, 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 your Johnson fondled. Now you have to pay them not to fondle you. This in <laughs> Land of the Free, uh, Home of the Brave, there's, there's really no end to this. I mean, every day there's things coming out that even shock me. I mean, I, I, I think I'm ready for it all. And it's, it's always topped. Oh, $5 isn't enough. Groping, groping. Uh, microwave ovens pretty soon. It's like suitcases of cash to travel. Listen, I, I don't want to be microwave or have you grab my genitals. Here's $5,000. Not enough. So we've got the Mexican cartels threatening football teams that can't come up here and play games in the U.S. now. In U.S., you know, Mexican football games, they don't pay $30,000. Well, I mean, hell, the TSA's got that beat. If you don't go along with what they say, they'll, uh, well, they'll break a few eggs, as they say, a few huevos. So we've got uh, that report here. You cannot make that up. But don't worry. The new national security force that the White House is announcing is going to be on the streets of America uh, has announced that well, uh, two-thirds of the time they think it's accurate and that at sports stadiums, shopping malls, airports, they're going to make you step in front of a camera that face scans you and that it supposedly can decide if you're a terrorist or not. is isn't about actually committing crimes or having associations with uh, CIA terrorists because all al-Qaeda is on record. No, it's, they just say, well, the machine says you're a terrorist. Goodbye, take him away. And we're seeing more and more of this across not just the U.S., but across the world where we've proven the old-fashioned lie detector systems are a scam. So now they're moving on to new forms of quackery. And they're like, hey, the computer says so. It's over. You can't fly. You're a terrorist. And if you think that's bad, don't worry. 
Al-Qaeda chief, Aman al-Zawari, is taking credit for the Arab Spring all over the Middle East, the rebellions, the overthrows of old Western dictators. And you know, that's gotta warm your heart a little bit. The known CIA operative along with Amar al who died secretly at the Pentagon. Just listen to that music. They've been given Libya now and missiles and billions of dollars. And they're taking credit for the Arab Spring that the West has been supporting. And if you're not for Al Qaeda taking over the Middle East, well, you're just not patriotic. So I'll say again for InfoWars Nightly News, if patriotism means worshiping Al Qaeda, I'm not patriotic. I'll have to apologize right there. Now, let's go ahead and shift gears from the Arab Spring and uh, the uh, Swiss yodel uh, that he's doing there and move on to something a little closer to the United States. And that is the Snoop Society. And I talked about this earlier. Every time I think I can't be shocked, I am. They have new snooping organizations where they tell you to call the police on people who have their lights on past seven o'clock at night in the winter. And of course, I pointed out to this website earlier this year, I sent them an email and I said, you know, a lot of people work past seven or eight o'clock in their business, like we're doing here right now. Uh, our lights are on in the office. Does that mean we're thought criminals? And so I wanna go through a couple of examples of this Snoop Society because the White House has now come out through one of their attack groups and funded a new organization, Attack Watch. And Attack Watch says anybody criticizing Obama, they imply you're a criminal, and they give you different ways on the internet to go out then and basically attack anybody criticizing Obama, as if it's illegal and wrong to disagree with all of the horrible things, torture, secret arrest, uh, making his buddies exempt from regulations he rams through. Uh, if you do that, you're a bad person, according to Attack Watch. And we're going to get more into that later, but I thought I would remind you, this is nothing new in our, in our little Orwellian journey. If you go back to three and a half years ago during the campaign in Missouri and a bunch of other states, they had police and others on TV saying, listen, if you criticize the president and say things about him that aren't true, he isn't a Christian or he's going to raise your taxes, which he ha has now done, uh, we're going to arrest you. Well, even if somebody's wrong about something and they weren't, they were right, it's your first amendment right. So this was all part of an intimidation tactic. Let's play that clip. Senator Barack Obama's presidential campaign is asking Missouri law enforcement to target anyone who lies or runs a misleading television ad during the presidential campaign. This first, John Mills is live at the county election board in Maplewood. He's been learning more about which members of law, law enforcement are getting involved in this. John, tell us more about this. Russell, good evening. Prosecutors and sheriffs from across Missouri are joining something called the Barack Obama Truth Squad. Two high-profile prosecutors are part of the team. We met them this afternoon in the Central West End. They are Jennifer Joyce from the city, Bob McCullough, the St. Louis County prosecuting attorney. They will be reminding voters that Barack Obama is a Christian who wants to cut taxes for anyone making less than $250,000 a year. President Obama today proposed something new, something called prolonged detention. Pre-crime is where people are arrested and incarcerated to prevent crimes that they have not yet committed. By the way, that clip of Rachel Maddow is from a couple of years ago when Obama first got in. I've talked to different MSNBC hosts, and some have gone public, saying that if they criticize Obama in any way, they're fired. And so you notice now she won't criticize Obama. She wanted to keep her job and take her 30 pieces of silver. The Young Turks guy, he had to bail. Look, whether you're conservative, liberal, or outside of that little box, you should really stand for what you stand for and not be a hypocrite. But, but, but yes, the president is pushing secret arrest for citizens, you name it. Now, this next little clip is EcoSnoop. Talk about creepy. This is what I was talking about earlier. On this website, it was like, look at this gas station. Their lights are on during the day. And it showed like this super foggy, dark day. And of course, their lights are on for the cars to pull in. This idea that just normal human activity is illegal and bad. And you've got to pay Al Gore some money or the earth's going to die. Um, 
let's go. At, yeah, in fact, there's the gas station photo right there. It's almost completely dark, and they're like, report on them. Look, they've got their lights on during the day. The day, what is that, like 5.30 a.m., right as the sun's starting to come up? Whatever, let's go ahead and go to the info, babe. Relishing, just totally getting off on, oh, you can snoop on people. It's so much fun. They didn't like Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia or East Germany. No, it's cool and sexy to be a snoop. Get involved in it today. The system is training us to relish and worship snooping and tattling, but they never want you to go after actual corruption. They want you at each other's throats. On this Snoop website that they teach school kids here in the U.S., we've confirmed, they say if someone's yard and landscaping isn't perfectly trimmed, call the police on them. Again, they want to get us all at each other's throats while the foreign banks rape the hell out of us. Here is the Eco Snoop Tyrant clip. Through EcoSnoop, the feet on the street environmentalist can tag and report environmental issues wherever they go. Let's try it out. Let's say we are walking past that same building with its lights on again, except this time we have EcoSnoop on our iPhone. Simply open EcoSnoop and snap a photo of the offense. Oh. Using GPS, EcoSnoop will tag the location of the My case. IQ so is about 70. Oh. The I'm an authoritarian, trendy aware. liberal. Homeland security begins with hometown security. That's why I'm pleased that Walmart is helping to make... This actually happens at Walmart, Mr. Napolitano. Security. If you see something suspicious in the parking lot or in the store, say something immediately. Well, I'm glad that Mr. Napolitano is on the job. 9,000 plus locations, Mall of America, Walmart, you name it. Now you, you, you can't escape government bombardment of information. You've got her up there saying, don't trust your neighbors, don't trust anybody. Don't we have one more clip of the whole see something, say something garbage? These ads are just everywhere. About And, and now on 9-11, there were 50 plus planes grounded. People would get to go to the bathroom, everyone would panic or... A box would fly out of the back of a pickup truck. They'd shut down major interstates. This is invoking hysteria. Land of the coward, home of the slave. To where now a piece of paper blows on the road and the public's like, ah, Help me, take my rights, foreign banks rape me. Ban free speech. There's a cardboard box. Save me, government. Meanwhile, the government is a bunch of criminals bringing in narcotics who stage the attacks. What do you expect from terrorists? Here's the final clip. see something suspicious, but you don't want to get involved. It's nothing you think. Can you be sure? If you see something, say something. And of course, now they have a tech watch. And they, they say that if you criticize anything Obama's doing, that it's basically evil and horrible and that you need to sign up with them to like in swarms of, of, of Obama bots who feel all trendy that don't know they're working for Goldman Sachs. You go out and attack anybody that doesn't 110% go along with them. All right, now I want to go ahead and get into our last story before we go to Lord Moncton with further comment. And then after that, we've got Stuart Rhodes joining us as well. Uh, there's no way to describe what a con artist Al Gore is. I mean, I never even used profanity on air in 16 years, and I, I have to use it for him. This person, I mean, I would not buy anything from them. If they came to my door, I would call the police. I mean, Al Gore is a swollen bag of scrofulous pus. Uh, Al Gore is an anti-American globalist who's called for a post-industrial America because he has investments with Maury Strong in China. When they shut down our industries, that increases their insider industries over there. And now he claims he controls reality. Al Gore now is running, as we speak, a 24-hour propaganda piece saying that it's a hoax that we don't believe in man-made global warming and that anyone who criticizes him works for oil companies. When we document, it is the major oil companies with Ken Lay with Al Gore on record. That's even in the New York Times, who came up with this to shut down coal that is their competition. Now, is coal perfect? Certainly not. Do they have a lobby fighting Al Gore? Some of them, yeah. 
but he mixes all of this together. So I want to play this clip, but this is a guy who wants you to pay more for less. This is a guy who's a globalist and hates this country. And this is a guy who has been so full of crap through the years. Do I need to list the examples? Invented the internet. The list goes, NAFTA and GATT are a great idea. It's a good deal, Larry, on Larry King Live. We'll go ahead and go to this disgusting clip. I probably can't watch much of it. I'm a mudslide. A forest can become kindling. Oh. Across the globe, cataclysmic Pay Al Gore money. occurring with such regularity that it's being called a new Pay norm. Al Gore money and there won't be forest fires. Uh, and there's something else. I say it was a trendy list. The truth about climate change. The truth. I big have the truth. Big coal are spending big I money the to internet. spread doubt about climate change. They've been able to do so quietly. But no, buddy, you are the hoax. The world will They've been able to do so quietly of with us trying to shut them down attention on the full like 24 hours of and I'm sorry. Climate crisis. 24 hours of Al Gore sitting on the toilet crapping on us. Look, I can't take any more. Shut it off. Shut it off. Shut it off. Look, the curtain's been pulled aside, little man. We know who you are. You're running a scam. You're trying to seize control of the entire society. With more on the mythical savior, the fabled man bear pig, the inventor of the internet, the gentleman that told us how great NAFTA and GATT would be and destroyed our economy, the person who owns large portions of a major oil company but lectures us all day and has palaces around the United States but tells little old ladies to cut back on their energy consumption, with more on the person who gives us the 24 hours of reality we wouldn't have reality or any form of truth uh, if it wasn't for our illustrious man bear pig. But the only person that can counter someone this powerful is an individual like Lord Christopher Monckton of Monckton and Brinchley, who of course is an inventor and researcher and scientist in his own right and a uh, top advisor to Margaret Thatcher. Uh, Lord Monckton, thank you so much for joining us uh, during the 24 hours of reality uh, Al Gore, uh, of course, told the Aspen Club a few weeks ago that they're in deep trouble and that more and more uh, they're basically being laughed at. I've seen them on another stage talking to pundits about it. Uh, their hoax is imploding, so now they're claiming that our response to them is a hoax. You have been the uh, chief individual exposing the true fraud. Uh, so has Man Bear Pig gotten to the precipice or has he already fallen from it? Well, Al Gore is all over the floor, and this relaunch, <clears throat> like everything else he touches, has turned out to be a spectacular failure, Alex, because why did he choose September the 14th? Well, the answer's quite easy, really. It is that that was the day on which he had hoped that the sea ice extent in the Arctic would have fallen to a new low in the 30-year satellite record. Trouble was, it didn't. He thought it was going to. He planned today to say, I told you so, it's all happening, the Arctic ice is melting. And in fact, of course, it hasn't happened. It's quite some way above where it was this time in 2007, which was the record low. And it appears already to have turned the corner from now on, of course, as the winter gathers strength in the Northern Hemisphere, so the sea ice will grow back just as it always does. So he got that wrong. And frankly, he knows that despite the billion, and it's now actually a hundred billion, that has been spent in the United States alone on promoting this global warming rubbish, the people aren't buying it anymore. Every time there's an extreme weather event, a drought in Texas, a few tornadoes, a bit of rain from the back end of a hurricane in New York, up in New York State, immediately Al Gore is there saying this is global warming. Except that the record of hurricanes over the last few years has been less activity than at any time in the satellite record. That's what I was about to say, and, and it, it's also come out that his film is lying. Polar bears are great swimmers. Their numbers have exploded. Uh, the Himalayas haven't melted. Kilimanjaro uh, is coming back. And I just saw on mainstream news, I should have had the article yesterday. In fact, I'll show it later if we can dig it out. But they admitted that this is one of the earliest times that the shrinkage has actually stopped and reversed back to growing. So that parlor trick of showing a satellite image 
of one of the poles during its, the summer when it starts shrinking and implying that it's all about to disappear when we know that it is a cyclical season thing, that huge fraud is imploding. And now, as you know, Der Spiegel last week came out and said, well, actual sea levels are dropping now. That's the global warming when Al Gore promised that we'd already be underwater. That's quite right. And indeed, uh, earlier this year, I published a paper by Professor Nicholas Myrna, who is the ranking world expert on sea level. And the title of the paper was Sea Level is Not Rising. And uh, this was in the spring, so he was well ahead of the curve here. And when he was due to introduce this paper at a Cambridge University climate conference that I was helping to organize, the organizers banned him from distributing the paper because they were so furious at the title, Sea Level is Not Rising. And of course, ever since then, it's been dropping like a stone. And the excuse of the usual suspect is that this is because global warming has meant more rainfall and therefore all the rain has gone on the land and it will eventually flow back into the ocean and the ocean will rise again. But frankly, these excuses that Gore and others come up with are beginning to wear terribly thin. And that the truth of the matter is that by a number of different measures, it's now been pretty well established that if we were to double the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere between now and the end of the century, that might cause maybe one Celsius of warming. That at the moment is most people's best guess, not the three or four or six or 11 that Gore and his mates have been saying, one Celsius, and that's harmless. And even if you wanted to try to stop the three or four or six Celsius that they have been trying to say will happen, it's 10 times cheaper to take the really rather small damage that such warming would cause than it is to try to make it go away. But Lord Monckton, uh, yeah. uh, you've broken these numbers down. I mean, you don't like to toot your horn, but you've been a trailblazer. They've talked about your arrest in Europe, saying that you're a climate denier. He is now running promo videos. I, I, I couldn't watch much of the 24-hour garbage, but I did watch some of it, but I watched the promo videos saying yeah. we're going after the deniers. Obama has launched this attack watch group that says report people to the authorities that criticize Obama. I mean, it seems they're really trying to go into an authoritarian mode. And he says, how dare them in this promo video uh, say that carbon dioxide isn't a pollutant, the evil oil companies. But in truth, most of the big oil companies have actually been on the bandwagon for a while, and they want to use it to shut down their competition in coal. So, so, <coughs> so that's another lie. What can you say about this, this, this call to criminally, because now it's happening to myself, to criminally come after us for denying our high priest Al Gore. A, I want you to comment on that, and then B, uh, how high have, from ice core samples, uh, carbon dioxide levels been in the past versus now? Okay, hold on to your hats and let's do that second question first. If we go back to the Neoproterozoic era, which is 750 million years ago, you're too young to remember, Alex. Uh, at that time, there was 30% CO2 in the atmosphere. How do we know? Because it was at that time that the dolomitic rocks were formed, and dolomitic rock can only form if it precipitates out from the sea, if there is a partial pressure of CO2 above the sea of at least 30%. We can tell this by doing experiments in the laboratory, so we know that. 30%. And how much is it today? Is it 5%? No. 10%? No. 2%? No. 1%? No. It's 0.04% today. And even when it was 30% in the atmosphere, glaciers a mile high came and went twice at sea level and at the equator. So there's no way that CO2 could possibly have the enormous warming effect which Gore and the usual suspects have been trying to pretend. It simply isn't happening. And now as to this a desperate attempt to criminalize you and me, Alex, for saying that we are climate deniers, notice how they use that word deniers. Uh, with all its overtones of Holocaust denial, they do it every day. Nobody bats an eyelid. But when in Australia recently I pointed out that one of their uh, economists had expressed opinions that were effectively fascist opinions. Oh, how Lord Lundy cried, all the left 
all the way across the world were saying Moncton is terrible, he has said that Professor X is a fascist. Well, no, I didn't say that. I said the opinion he expressed in saying that there is no alternative to, but to believe exactly what one narrow version of climate science tells us. Well, a bunch, hold on, hold on, Lord Moncton. A bunch of them are in the news calling for green fascism, not the particular guy, but I've seen it all over the news. Carbon rationing, carbon cards, uh, they call it green fascism, and, and, and they say, we don't make any excuses. We need to be authoritarian. I've even seen Financial Times of London articles written by their foreign editor. Uh, one was titled, and now for world government, saying it needs to be authoritarian because the people won't do what's right. We'll just make them. I, I mean, you, you're one of the top researchers. I mean, how many of them have said that? Things like this. It's been happening all over the place. In fact, the European Union, secretly now, because when I first exposed it, they, they put it underground, they are already drawing up plans for a European and eventually international environmental criminal court where anyone like you and me who dares to say that there are real scientific doubts published in the peer-reviewed literature about how far this scare is going to go, uh, then these plans are already being laid as we speak. And the only way to stop it is to vote out governments that go along with this rubbish. Now, in Britain, that gives us a problem because all the major parties still go along with this rubbish, despite the mounting evidence they've got it wrong. And I want to come on to that briefly, Alex, because the, the fact is they have got it wrong. If we go back to 1950, how much warming has occurred since then? Well, it's warming at a rate of about 0.7 Celsius since that time. That's the equivalent of one Celsius per century. Go back to 1850. Let's imagine the fastest rate of warming that lasted for more than a decade since 1850 were to become the average rate of warming over the next 90 years. How much warming would we get over the whole century? one Celsius. Go back to 1750 and look at the amount of radiative forcing, as the IPCC calls it, that they say has happened. How much temperature changed since 1750? Only about 0.8 to 0.9 Celsius. And so how much warming would we expect to see over the next century if that carried on? Answer, one Celsius. But it Lord Martin... You do the sums. It's only going to be one Celsius for a doubling. There isn't a problem. And that's their problem because they have told us there's going to be a problem. They now know as well as you and I do that the actual record of temperatures is simply not responding as they said. And so the only way to force us to obey what they say is to say that if we dare to point out the obvious, we will go to prison for it. Well, I will be proud to go there. Lord Moncton, uh, specifically uh, talking here with you, um, you always go over the scientific evidence, and you always repeat it over and over again, and you've been proven in your reports time and time again. I can't think of a time that I've seen you uh, uh, really be mistaken because you're going off scientific research and facts that are available. Two years ago, the Climate Gate emails come out where they're lying and, and, and organizing the uh, structure. Um, in, in their different grants around the world to do this. We know that their agenda is a power grab and to be able to shut down competition uh, that isn't part of their inside little club. But now, I mean, if you even look at the plans they want, and this is what I've been successful talking to their, to their cult followers with, is to explain, if China's building multiple new coal power plants a week, and we can't even build really any here a year, and they're shutting down old ones, and ours are much cleaner than China, and it's one world, well then why is shutting down our plants and moving them to China, where they're even dirtier, going to help? And they go, wow, that's a really good point. I mean, getting all the science aside, their solutions of paying Al Gore and Lord Rothschild carbon money is not going to fix anything, and it just allows them to turn the green police loose on the general public, uh, and it's nothing but a fascistic power grab. And I think, I think at the end of the day, that's the key. <laughs> this is quite right. I mean, I've got a paper out for review at the moment with the Journal of Energy, Energy Policy, which goes into this very question of just how useless it actually is if you try to make global warming go away. And just for the sake of the argument, I've pretended, even though I don't believe a word of it, that the amount of warming we're likely to get is going to be as big as the 
uh, usual suspects pretend that it is. I said, OK, let's go along with the so-called official figures. And then let's look at the solutions, such as the ones you've just talked about. Close down all the clean coal-fired power stations in the West, open lots of filthy ones in China. How does that improve the planet? What I've done is to work out how much it's going to cost to make just one Celsius of global warming go away if you follow the measures to reduce CO2 emissions that they are recommending? And the answer is, it's 10 times more expensive than it would be to sit back, enjoy the sunshine, and put up with such relatively small damage as might occur if the global warming happened at the rate which they forecast, which it won't. And this is the kind of conversation, to use a word that Al Gore frequently comes up with, this is the kind of conversation that Al Gore won't have. Al, baby, you're still running from me. You can run, but you can't hide. I'm coming to get you. It's no good standing there like a sort of high priest. And a conversation is a two-sided process, Al, baby. And if you won't debate with me or anyone who understands the science or economics behind this garbage of yours, then nobody but nobody is going to believe you anymore. Your day is done. Well, Lord Moncton, you're too kind, Al Gore. You say he thought that the ice caps would really melt. You th he thought sea levels were going to rise. He thought it'd be 10 degrees hotter and we'd all be dead. This guy's always changing his story. As you know, 30 years ago, they were saying it was global freezing at, at the Club of Rome. They cold-bloodedly, if you read the Richard N. Haas CFR reports and others, say decades ago that they were going to use this to organize society for a global government. They're now using the banking crisis that they engineered uh, to, to try to now transfer the euro into an even more dictatorial system, complete with euro football teams, uh, which I know you've, you've talked about world government. I mean, I really think my only criticism of you is that you're too gentlemanly and you're being too kind. This is not someone who's wrong. I will call him for what he is, a criminal con artist who wants to commit genocide. He knows full well with the State Department memorandums like 200 that if they put those carbon uh, taxes in on the third world, it's a death sentence in the next decade, as you've documented, for a billion people. This is a Hitler in waiting, and I will call him for what he is. Where? I mean, bottom line, in your view, is Al Gore conscious of this? I think Al Gore knows quite well that he's got this wrong. I don't think he ever really intended to get it right. I, th I think you are correct. Right from the start, his agenda was to force a particular result on the community, whether it was true or not. In June 1988, he waited into a, for, until a particularly hot day in that particularly hot month. He then had the air conditioning turned off in Congress that day when he, his friend and financial benefactor, uh, James Hansen, testified that the rate of warming was going to be, uh, as it turns out, four times greater than it actually has been. And so it was all designed to terrify Congress, to fool them into going along with this rubbish. And of course, for a time, he was successful. But the virtue, I think, um, Alex, of the still small voice of calm that I try to represent here, just going at them time and time again on the science, pointing out that the science doesn't say what they say it says. It doesn't say we've definitely got a problem. It increasingly says we definitely haven't got a problem. Uh, that even if the science were not to say that, the economists who have examined this are nearly unanimous in the peer-reviewed literature, saying that it's cheaper to do nothing than to lift a finger now. That is the clear advice of Bjorn Lomborg, Richard Toll, William Nordhaus, David Henderson. I could go on naming them all day. If you do science by consensus, which you and I don't, well, let's just tell the other side, because they do, the consensus in the economic peer-reviewed literature is that even if the problem is as big as they say it is, scientifically, it's cheaper to do nothing about it at all. There are many real problems around the world. There's still far too much starvation poverty and disease, which we could be getting rid of instead. Yes, sir. Oh, these billions on all this rubbish. Lord Moncton, in closing, um, it's important to give out some of your websites that have just incredible uh, research. Uh, they're available for everyone. Uh, but in closing, sir, um, specifically looking into the future, 
by going back to the past, just two years ago, there was still a fake consensus in the big corporate dominant media that no real scientist disagreed with what Al Gore said, and he was the high priest, almost like the voice of God speaking to Moses. Two short years later, they are a laughing stock, and I've seen Al Gore in speeches and interviews where even his uh, fellow travelers in this power grab say, my friends laugh at me, even liberals do. And uh, I, I'm a talk radio host, I do a lot of interviews, I talk to people on the street. Uh, I would say their cult has shrunk by about 90% and they're in deep trouble. So, so where do we, I mean, A, do you agree with that? And B, where do we go from here? How are they going to try to regroup and, and how do we finally uh, put this uh, monstrosity uh, into the dust heap, the grave of uh, frauds? Right. I think nothing is really going to stop until somebody gets prosecuted. The fact is there's enough bogus science out there, people producing deliberately false results in the IPCC's documents for interest, inter interest uh, a very good example. <coughs> this, it's now very clear that if we're going to stop them, we've got to put one or two of these bogus scientists behind bars. Now, let me be clear about this. If you're producing honest science, that says you think we've got a problem, that's fine by me. You do the science and we can talk about it. But if you're producing bogus science and you're bending the data and using dodgy statistical techniques and you know who you are, then we are now coming after you. I've recently been quietly writing round to professors of statistics, giving them a set of data, not saying what it is, and asking them to do a very simple piece of analysis on it for me. So far, they've all refused because they have guessed that what I've stumbled upon is an enormous fraud right at the heart of the IPCC's documents. And they, because they don't dare to sustain the sort of pressure that you and I get put under, they are not willing simply to do a straightforward statistical calculation for fear that they will have to point out what nonsense this all is. So the corruption of science will only be brought to an end when one or two scientists realize that they are not above the same laws that we have to follow. And that if they are perpetrating scientific frauds, it's no good putting on a white coat and saying we are immune because we are scientists and academic freedom includes the freedom to lie and commit fraud. No, it doesn't. And this and is not damaging scientists who have been going around deliberately falsifying, exaggerating the supposed certainty of this, making bogus results, tweaking graphs in, in various ways, abolishing the medieval warm period. And the guy who did that is already having his collar felt by the prosecuting authorities. We are closing on on these people. One or two of them, that'll be enough. Send them to jail for a good long time and the rest will run for cover and learn that in future, if you want to do science, you must do honest science or go to jail for it. Well, that, uh, I absolutely agree with you because this is not turnabout as fair play. They're saying arrest you, arrest myself and many others. Th we have our free speech and, and, and we're doing our research. We're not getting taxpayer funds than deliberately putting out fraud and then calling to tax people and take over society. I mean, this is clear fraud, and if they're able to carry out their policies, would result, uh, and we're talking about a billion souls or more, and just very briefly, because we've got to go, and I know you're also busy as well, um, what are the numbers you have? Because the numbers I have I've seen are a billion dead over a decade if they put the Copenhagen Treaty into place. What are your numbers on that? Very briefly, and then give us your website. All right. If what's going to happen is if, if they don't start spending on the poor, the money they're now spending on global warming, then, as you rightly say, about a billion are going to die whose lives could have been saved. And that's before you start in on the huge damage they'll do to the economies of the West. And if the economies of the West go under, then the economy of the rest of the world goes under with it. So we've got to stop this nonsense now. It's cost far too much already. A few people have got very rich. A lot of people have become a great deal poorer because of this. Enough is enough. The science is in. The truth is out. The game is up. And the scare is over. Well, we're glad that you're out there exposing these people because we know that Maury Strong and others said, as well as uh, Mr. Hansen and countless others, that they want a post-industrial world. 
And uh, since Al Gore sold us NAFTA and GATT and, and, the, and the environmental rules so far, they've done a great job. Uh, England is being deindustrialized. Uh, the United States is completely falling apart. And hopefully we can reverse this before, um, before these saboteurs uh, complete their job. Lord Moncton, thank you so much for spending time with us. Again, what's the best website to visit? Yes, certainly, at scienceandpublicpolicy.org. And just one little vignette to end. I showed the IPCC's latest bogus graph to a senior member of Congress in the House of Representatives just a couple of years ago. And he took one look at it and he said, they can't have done that. I said, they have. And he turned to his colleagues and he said, gentlemen, I think we've seen all we need to see. So now the Republicans have realized that this is nonsense scientifically, it is dangerous economically, and they, almost to a man, are now opposed to this nonsense. That is a very important change. So you do now have a choice in America that we don't have in Europe. You can vote Democrat and have more of this rubbish, or you can vote the other way and put a stop to it. Well, you're right. All the Republican candidates, except for Newt Gingrich, uh, are promoting it. I don't trust Mitt Romney because he supported it previously. Uh, and I'm not normally a lesser of two evils guy, but there's no doubt Al Gore uh, giving waivers to General Electric for their power plants and shutting down the others. I mean, the, these are actual s s saboteurs. Lord Moncton, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Alex. God bless America. Thank you so much. There goes Lord Christopher Moncton. He is really the prime mover. Um, when it comes to exposing this fraud, his information is absolutely essential. We're going to go to break and come back with the founder of Oath Keepers, Stuart Rhodes, with an update on Courtside, Arizona. It's been uh, turned into a police state um, by the, uh, quote, city officials who, quote, fired the mayor and police. And we're also going to look at the uh, super congress that's been set up to fleece the United States and more coming up on the other side with the conclusion of InfoWars Nightly News with Stuart Rhodes. I'm Alex Jones. The American dream. There's a reason they call it a dream. <laughs> Who's there? Cock-a-doodle-doo, pal. No, 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 no! I don't have any more money! My job sucks right now, please! I'll have more money next month! You can't take my house! Is that your signature? It is a private bank owned by private stockholders. A, a, a private bank? Do not let the name Federal fool you. If I got this money from the bank, and the bank got it from the Federal Reserve dump tracks, where does the Federal Reserve get their money? They take our property away, just like Thomas Jefferson said they would. Those sons of bitches! It's the greatest theft in human history. It's InfoWars Nightly News. We are back. What an amazing interview with Lord Moncton. It is certainly a serious blow against tyranny that the Al Gore, George Soros, global government carbon tax fraud is burning and in flames. The dragon's down, but it's not out. But if we continue to expose these criminal fraudsters, we're going to end up winning. We're winning the big battles, but we've got to keep the war against tyranny going. Now, Somebody else who's having an incredible effect is Stuart Rhodes. He's a top of his class, Yale Law graduate, uh, Army veteran paratrooper, of course, uh, worked on Ron Paul's uh, congressional office. And a few years ago, he founded Oath Keepers, and it's been demonized and attacked. All they say is, hey, we want military and police to follow their oath to protect and defend the Constitution and our republic to be good guys. Uh, because tyranny will come to your door in a uniform, but liberty also can be defended by a uniform, and so it's, 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 it's a sacred honor. 
But I tell you, he got criticized for bringing up checkpoints and gun confiscation and martial law during collapses a few years ago, I guess three years ago or so, when they founded Oath Keepers. Maybe it's been longer, time flies. And now all that's mainstream news. Now that's a serious discussion that needs to happen because he's a veteran and a historian and a constitutional lawyer. He saw what was happening, as many of us did, and got out there with a much needed message to police and military. So I want to talk about the Super Congress with him. I want to talk about Quartzsite and get an update there because they got a rally coming up in the bizarre activities. And this hype I keep hearing. And they've even had people on Fox News talk about a coup against Obama. A terrible idea. That would only be a police state pretext, only be used to crack down. Obama is a puppet. We need to abolish the Federal Reserve and restore the Republic and have the Congress take its power back from the president. The president is becoming a dictator, but not individually. The office is being given those powers by the offshore banks. So Obama could be sent to Pluto tomorrow, and like shark teeth, more puppets would roll into place. We don't want the low-level nobodies like Obama, with all the parades and pomp and circumstance to make you think the buck stops with him. We want the people running the puppets, and we're identifying them here each and every night. With more on all these subjects is Stuart Rhodes of OathKeepers.org. Stuart, great to have you here with us tonight. Good to go, Alex. Good to be here. Well, you heard me throw out the uh, gambit of, of issues. Take any one you want in order or bring something up that I didn't mention. Well, I think you're, you're dead on. That the, the great danger, one of the great dangers is, is that in response to the chaos that's being, that's being created through the destruction of our currency, uh, people will be tempted to look for a silver bullet. And the temptation will be to jump into the arms of a bunch of neocon generals, military industrial complex uh, CEOs. And that kind of chatter's been out there for a couple of years now. I get it a lot with Oath Keepers, people saying, well, you should march on DC and, and the military should go in there and, and kick them all out and take over. But there is no, there's no constitutional sanction whatsoever for that being done. And really, it'd be like the most uh, the most diabolical way to get the American people to scrap the Constitution, would make, make them think that they must jump into a military coup to save themselves. And so we have to, you know, warn against that. Remind them that the actual answer is state nullification, as as Madison and Jefferson pointed out way back in 1798 in the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions. That's the answer: is the states standing up? That's the constitutional remedy. Not uh, not jumping into and that's what the John Warner Defense Authorization Act and Bush and now Obama with the Governor's Council has done. If you read John Warner Defense Authorization as you have ninety seven uh, two thousand and seven, excuse me, they say this is for insurrection in the states. It can even remove governors, bring in generals. They understand that is the silver bullet put there by the founders. But it's not an easy silver bullet. We've got to take the states back to do that, but that is the remedy. So they're trying to head that off. They're trying to demonize it. They're trying to call it secession. But it's not secession, is it? Well, no, nullification, is, as, as Thomas Woods points out in his book, nullification is, is actually the middle ground. It's, the, it's the, um, the mild constitutional remedy before you leave the constitutional union. I mean, and the way to look at this is that they're destroying the union itself. But it's, this is the way to correct it, and, and it's the constitutional method. It's the only constitutional method of correction. Um, anything else is destroying the Constitution. Whether it's letting the president do what he wants to do, letting Congress walk all over us, or jumping into the arms of a military coup to stop them, those are both destructive. Stuart, I want you to elaborate uh, as a constitutional lawyer and somebody who's worked in Congress on your view of the Super Congress. The way I read it um, a month or so ago when they put it into place, this republic is dying, not with a bang, but with a whimper. A 12-member council that originates spending and cutting bills, that's the power of the purse, is supposed to come out of individual House members and be debated. It bypasses that. And if the Congress doesn't go along with their recommendation, then the super committee's bill goes through. I mean, this is, in the 230-plus years, we've never seen this, not even under Lincoln. He just ignored Congress. This is a weird legalese lawyer way to act like Congress is still there, but it's been replaced with the 12 ring wraiths with Obama as the head of the Council of 13. Just unprecedented. And it also gives to, to the president the authority to raise the debt limit on his own. That's something else it does that most folks aren't paying attention to. He can raise, at his own discretion, raise the debt limit, and all that Congress can do in reaction to it 
is to pass that legislation to stop it, but then he can just veto that legislation. So it puts Congress in the perverse uh, posture of being the reactor and him the initiator of, of legislation himself. So we have him launching wars in Libya and saying he doesn't need congressional approval openly. He has the UN for authority, treason. Um, and I want to ask you if you, in, in your view of that isn't treason, what is? Um, then we have the power of the purse being transferred to the president. Um, it's amazing. Well, sure. He's, he's, they're putting, this is the same, this is the same process that, that Germany went through. Uh, you, you make it legal. The Nazis made everything they did legal. This is, this is the same thing. They are destroying the, the fabric of the Republic and putting as much power as possible into the hands of the executive branch. And you've got both, it's a bipartisan um, assault. You've got people, so-called so Tea Party leaders, like Alan West, unfortunately, guys like that, everyone was all, yeah, they're great Tea Party people. They voted for this monstrosity. And what they voted for is the destruction of the principle of, of a representative government. And they voted for an elected dictatorship. That's what this is setting up. The president can do what he wants. Congress is it's kind of like the ancient Roman in uh, ancient Roman Senate, he's become meaningless. Kind of a you know, the Senate's become a, a rubber stamp. A and ceremonial vestigial uh, uh, thing. They don't get rid of it completely. They, they they just let them debate it. But if they don't do what the emperor wants, well, the emperor does it uh, regardless. And and now that power's passed. You know, that's what's so frightening about this is we're seeing incredibly historical tyrannical things happening, and it's not even an issue. And then Ron Paul raises it. And the media says, look at the kook. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think a lot of these bureaucrats and minions and even corporate chiefs realize in every case in history, once you unloose unbridled power, then the most horrible of people go into that void and it invariably degenerates into hell itself. Yeah, they always, think, they always believe they can control it. And they see themselves as being you know, part of the inner circle. And so they go along with the destruction. And no, Congressman Paul is correct, and, and, and frankly, I think that anybody in Congress who voted for that, that ridiculous bill should be kicked out on the curb. I don't care how, how, how much they would like for any other reason, they should go, because they don't understand the Constitution. Let and me ask you this, talking to the tens of thousands of Oath Keepers and your supporters out there, you had talked last time we spoke a few months ago that the, that the awakening was accelerating. Has all this new, openly illegal behavior uh, hastened an even faster awakening. Yeah, I think it has. We got a phone call just the other day from a sergeant in Afghanistan, and he wanted to let us know that among all of those troops, um, they're all waking up, and quite a few of them are very much aware of the whole picture. Let's put it that way. He was, you know, he asked us uh, some pretty pointed questions, and uh, we gave our responses, and he, he said, "Well, we agree. We see it. We see it the same way you do." And so I think the Libya fiasco has opened a lot of their eyes because here you've got a president who's not even claiming to be acting as the president of the United States and consulting Congress. You know, Bush made at least made noises about consulting Congress before he waged war. Here Obama just went straight to the UN, and they see that and they understand what's really happening. They know who, who his real masters are, and so I think that there's a kind of a turning of the tide among the troops. Well, for those that don't understand this as a military uh, a veteran yourself, as a constitutional lawyer, as somebody who's worked in Congress. I mean, this is 101, and so I want your take on it, that when the president says to Congress, and Congress says, hey, you've got to get authority from us, and he says, no, I don't, but he didn't just say that he had the power, he then groveled to the UN and put a statement out at whitehouse.gov saying, I did this for the credibility of the UN. He's saying, the UN is my boss. That's where the treason comes in. It's not just that he's a tyrant or unconstitutional. The treason is when you go under a foreign power, when you subordinate and seize governmental powers against the Constitution for another power. That's the definition of treason. And when an officer who's sworn an oath does it, it becomes high treason or opening the drawbridge to the enemy. As a constitutional lawyer, do you concur with that analysis? Well, I mean, treason defined by Article 3 is, is, to, is to wage war against the United States or aid and bet um, its enemies. And usually you have a declared war to let you know who the enemy is, who you should not be, be consorting with. And so you know, I'm not sure if it fits the, the, the strict definition of treason the founders put in place. Um, although I consider the United Nations to be our enemy, 
So I, I think it certainly is. Um, there's certainly an argument made there. Well, here's what I'm saying. In the more classical view of treason, let's say it's a sovereign. If, the, if, if a prince of England, and there were some of these cases, consorted with the French king to overthrow his brother so that the French king would come in and invade and put him on the throne, they'd cut your head off. That's high treason. And so this is a level of treason that perhaps the founders couldn't even foresee, where the president is suborning and taking orders from a foreign institution. I mean, if that is not treason, what is? Well, they, they certainly understood that could happen, which is why they require that the president be a natural-born citizen. They were concerned about the influence of, of foreign, uh, foreign loyalties and foreign allegiances. And so there, there is that. But You're just, right, I, they were concerned, but I mean, it, for me, it's treason. And I'll just say it, he, he's a tyrant, he's a traitor, he's a piece of trash, but he's a puppet. Well, I think, I think that's true. And, and, and what, I would, what I would, you know, also add is that this is nothing new. Unfortunately, since World War II, since the creation of the United Nations, we have sent our, our men in harm's, into harm's way on behalf of the United Nations. Sure, but this is the first, but usually Congress agrees to it. And, I, and, and you right. know, Private Michael knew all that. I mean, for me to have the president saying, I don't need you, Congress, when they're even, you know, going public with it, I've got the U.N., I mean, what, uh, next will he say Russia gave him an order? Maybe maybe China, because they own our debt? I mean, this is one hell of a precedent, Stuart. Well, it surely is. He's just taking the next logical step, just like he's taking the next logical step on seeing he can assassinate American citizens found wherever they are. So he's just taking it to the next next level. But I just, you know, I want to make it very clear that Bush did the same thing, although not as, not as blatant as far as... Well, yeah, no, that's as you said. That's how the tyranny works. It gets crazier and crazier. So by logical extension, what do you predict as the next move by this president or the next one if it's not Ron Paul? I mean, how much further does it go? Well, if he could wage war under UN mandate, setting aside the requirements of the Constitution for, for Congress to declare war, if he can sidestep Congress for that, and he can sidestep Congress when it comes to raising the debt limit, then he can sidestep Congress for anything. And he can do it under the, under the uh, rubric of the United Nations. And so I wouldn't be surprised if he's if he's foolish enough to try to do a you know gun ban treaty or something like that uh, through the, through the United Nations. So if he can't get it done, it's, this is the pattern of executive. If he can't get it done through Congress, they ignore Congress and claim the powers of the executive branch. Well, now they're going a step beyond that and saying, even forget about that. It's under the United Nations. I have well, that's my next point. If they put in the Unidir Treaty that calls for a small arms ban, handguns, rifles, all of it, and even even mainline pundits have, have, have written letters. Congress people have gone public, as you know, in the last month and said they're really trying to sign this treaty. If it's not treason, what is it when the government goes to a foreign power and says, we're taking your guns? I mean, for me, that's treason against the Bill of Rights Constitution, against the Republic. I mean, it's overthrowing the system, disarming us, making us slaves, is waging war against us. I agree. I, I would agree with that. I would say that at that point, they've crossed the line into making war on the American people. And I, and I think the response would be, would be uh, surprising to them, let's put it that way. I, don't, I do not believe the people of the United States are going to go along with that. Um, and frankly, if we went along with that, we deserve to be slaves. Now, Stuart, I want to move quickly now in the time we have left with you here at InfoWars Nightly News. Again, the websites are prisonplanet.tv and InfoWarsNews.com. We're adding a lot of new features, as viewers know. We're bringing you this true alternative, true constitutional, liberty-based uh, news because of your support. We couldn't have done it if you're not a subscriber watching this in another venue out there. I know some TV stations are now even taking the live feed at 7 p.m. Central. Please think about becoming subscribers to PrisonPlanet.tv if you want to not be behind us, but right beside us in this fight. Quartzsite. Recap briefly what's happened in court site and the latest developments and, and, and now what's coming up, Stuart. Then I want to get into Fast and Furious uh, with you, and we'll leave it at that. Sounds good. Well, court site, we just had a rally down there. We had Jordan Page uh, come and join us and play, and we went there in support of the 10 police officers who stood up and blew the whistle on their chief for arresting political opponents. And so they said, we're not going to go along with this. It was on point with our, with our message and other keepers. And we figure, hey, we're gonna, we got, we need to support them to do the right thing. And so we had ten stand-up cops who did the right thing. We went down there and supported them, and we actually managed to get uh, two sitting Arizona state legislators, Representative Burgess and also Representative Seal, to join us there in court side and speak to the officers. And they're contemplating, at least, at least looking into holding hearings to. Uh, Sure, sure. I should have pointed out you already had one rally. I had read that also now more 
uh, are planned. But, but, but this is amazing. Hundreds and hundreds of people shown in the middle of nowhere. Uh, tell, tell viewers, though, recapping exactly what happened in courtside, because some people don't know. Well, it started with the arrest of Jennifer Jones. It went all over YouTube, but it, but it had been going on before that. Uh, that was the most blatant example right there on video of someone being arrested because they didn't like her free speech. It was really an Alice in Wonderland experience to watch the town council uh, make a, one guy made a motion to remove her from the podium, and that was seconded, and, and they all voted for it. And the mayor sitting there going, Mary Foster, saying, hey, wait a minute, you can't do this. You can't remove her for, for free speech. But they overrid his, his, his objection. They ordered the chief of police to go arrest her, and he did. He hauled her out because... They didn't like what she was asking. She was asking tough questions about finances. Where's the money going? And so they had her arrested. And that was the kind of the start of it. Then the 10 officers um, did their resolution saying, we, we don't trust the chief. He should be put on suspension until there's an investigation done by the state. And they called for a state investigation. And they, had, they actually had the police union there uh, for a change, standing up for the right thing, coming in on the side of the 10 officers against the chief. And so we saw that that was too important an example of what's, what's, what's right and what should be done for us to, to ignore. We want to go there and support them, and, and ho we hope that more police officers across the country will do the same thing. Stand up and, and keep their oath and do what's right. I agree with you, and we'll continue to watch this uh, as it develops, because if they can get away with what they've done in the court site, they can basically get away uh, with anything. Uh, now, now, Stuart, I want to get now into a final subject. I don't have words to describe the federal docket that we covered last night in Chicago, the Chicago Tribune, the El Paso Times. It's all been released. It's all been confirmed. Sinaloa drug cartel, probably the biggest in Mexico, definitely the biggest in the north. And that's where all the drugs are coming through, 500 billion a year. Financed by the ATF and the CIA. And they've now said, yes, you know, this guy does work for us and he does deserve immunity. The head of U.S. operations, number two in the Sinaloa cartel. Here's just another example. Uh, so it's not just guns being shipped into Mexico and Honduras, but now we learn Chicago, Indianapolis, uh, Tampa, all over the country. I mean, it, it even shocks me that the feds are so corrupt that at least for two and a half years, we have evidence that went back to Bush, that they're shipping guns all over Mexico, all over Latin America to gangs they're using to knock out their competition and guns into the U.S. to then also blame the Second Amendment. And for five years, Sinaloa reportedly shipped in tens of billions of dollars just through Texas, uh, New Mexico and Arizona with full federal support. I mean, this is just mind blowing that it all comes out and nobody gets in trouble. If we know about this, Stuart, what else is going on? Yeah, it reminds you of the uh, drug smuggling through Arkansas, right? Yeah, exactly. Arkansas and, 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 and Mina. Right, exactly. Um, this, this is something you really should have David Codrea and Mike Vanderbilt come on your show and talk about this. Those are the two bloggers that really blew that whole um, gun runner thing wide open this last year and have been relentless in making sure. Sure, it started in Arizona, but it's turned out it's just everywhere. Drugs, smuggling, guns, everything. Right, yeah, absolutely. And so this is this is kind of like the climate change stuff that got exposed. If we could expose this and keep the drum beat up, it kind of puts the nail in the coffin, at least for now, of any attempts to destroy the Second Amendment. Same kind of thing. If the, if the average you know Joe out there sees it for what it really is, it's not going to buy it. Then they can manipulate all they want, and, you know, and create create chaos and havoc on the border all they want, and no one's going to fall for it. Well, that's my point. Is though, if we caught them on this, you know, you find two or three roaches when you turn the light on. Imagine what's behind the walls. I, I mean, this is yeah. even it even shocks me that it's this bold, this wild. I mean, they're not just shipping drugs in; they're shipping guns all over, and then blaming the Second Amendment for it, even when they get caught. Uh, it's just wow. Well, but they, they rely on the mainstream media to keep doing that, but we have alternative media like you, and so I think that that's that's the problem for them is they know that you know eventually the gig is going to be up. The average person is going to there's going to be a mind shift, you know, a, a tipping of the tipping of the balance among the populace, and they're going to see them for, as being illegitimate. And so they're they're in a race. I think they're they know that you know the clock is ticking on their own legitimacy. And so my concern is they're going to try to pull the plug and and try to create chaos 
um, and, and clamp down with martial law before we get to the point of that tipping point of awakeness. I agree with you, but we've pre-warned people, and I would challenge the globalists not to miscalculate. I, I, I know they're going to lose if they go to that, but it's going to cause a lot of pain. That's why I'm trying to avert it. But uh, no doubt they're prepping everybody for a false flag to be blamed on Tea Party, Patriot-type groups. But it's Oath Keepers that's telling police, military, law enforcement to keep their oath. And it was ATF agents that actually did the right thing and began to blow the whistle. Then alternative media picked it up. And now here we are. So that gives me a lot of faith, Stuart. And that's why the work you're doing at Oath Keepers is so essential. If it wasn't essential, you wouldn't have ADL, Southern Poverty Law Center, and all these other miscreant, globalist, anti-American organizations lying about you, demonizing you. And we all know you wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the prayers and support of everybody out there. Stuart Rhodes, God bless you. And I hope people visit OathKeepers.org. Thank you, Alex. Likewise. We're going to defeat these tyrants. Thank you for joining us. Well, that's it for InfoWars Nightly News. Lord willing, we'll see you back here tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Central. And yes, you found it, ladies and gentlemen. You found it, the modern-day spirit of 1776, and we mean to spread liberty worldwide. We'll see you back tomorrow night.